great to see uh, how many? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, including me, people interested in X here already. I think we, it's, it's, it's great to, to see you all and uh, people uh, seem interested in X here. <laughs> Hi everybody outside. Hope you enjoy it as much as I do. There is no camera. It's not here. <laughs> Don't feel pressure. So this is an experiment. I started the meetup um, just to see how many people are interested in this exciting languages, uh, language. And why is it exciting for me? Uh, I don't know. Actually, it makes just sense. And I, uh, my first encounter to Alan, maybe it's interesting for you because it's a long time ago. Uh, and I was in Germany, I'm from Germany. And there was a guy at a meetup, a PhD meetup, I think, in Frankfurt, which is the center of Germany. And he was talking about this crazy language, it's called Erlangen, and it's called like a German city, actually, like Erlangen is also Erlangen, is a German city. <laughs> I was like, what is this? And then he showed the code, and it was like, hi. Hey. Like, it's great how, how passionate he is about this, and um, I had no clue what it is. And somehow it always bubbled up somewhere. Alan, Alan uh, distributed systems, um, the nine nines, mm -hmm. is that correct? 99, blah, blah, blah. So 100%. Uptime, oh, great. Concurrent. And then I forgot everything about it. I did not forget that it's very hard to program. <laughs> I was a PhD programmer back then, oh my god. And then I saw some, somehow, I don't know how it happens, but it just happened that I saw um, a sample about, about Ruby and it, I really liked the, the approach of Ruby. Like, it's beautiful, it's developed with humans in mind. And then I saw some, that, some like, actually a decade later, um, the same applied to something I already forgot, uh, Erlang. Like, Erlang, the concept made sense, but now I don't know what it means. Like, it's the programming on that and beauty of Ruby combined. What a genius <coughs> idea. And I got actually hooked like I'd like to learn a new language. I was about to go. And then I said, okay, this is it. How do you learn in my age, a bit older maybe, I don't know. How do you get started with a language? Maybe you can share some ideas. I do it like I jump into the cold water and create a meetup group. <laughs> okay. And see how many people can inspire themselves because I totally believe in that it's, you have a, a nice idea and uh, you can share some knowledge and some resources and I'd like, I'd like to show what I have. And then you say, oh, great, or um, I have something better. Or I can recommend a book. For example, um, I downloaded all the books about Alexia, probably you can have a look at it. Interested. Um, so, any questions so far? Who am I? I'm interested. I'm going for software in Singapore. Interested in all the crazy things, and I'm more consultant. I, I, I love the program. I'm more like um, DevOps consultant, like bringing people together instead of programming code. But I understand code. I hope. And some concepts of, of Alexia made actually very much sense and changed my way of thinking about programming. It was very interesting. I saw it like um, David from the Red Rock. Mm -hmm. Dave. Um, I saw a talk from him and he was like, very passionate about it. I like when people are passionate, actually. Um, and I was like, there has to be a reason behind this. And then I understood, like, wow, this is really a good combination of something solid, like over 20 years ago. Alan is more, I don't know, very old actually, and putting some new uh, concept on top of it, and having all the benefits from beautiful language that is designed for, for tolerance, and a beautiful language that is designed for humans, it's like, oh yeah, it's cool. <laughs> very useful, and changed my way of, like, of, th of thinking about programming actually. Then he explains, and um, it's like I wanted to have a language like this for a long time. Actually, and I see my colleagues um, struggling with concurrency and threat handling in Java, and Clojure's new hit mm -hmm. shit. Can I swear? <laughs> sure. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> Actually, there's no need to swear because we're talking about Alexia. Um, we're using some normal <laughs> language. Um, more like, yeah, let's do this. And so have you already used Elixir somewhere, like uh, in your work, or is it just for hobby right now? This is a very good question. I um, I wanted to have a project so I can work on. I'm I'm more like a hands-on guy. Mm -hmm. I want to uh, have a project. But I like that to have a project I can work on. So I'm, I can read a book. I can get inspired, but I, I really learn on coding. And so far, when I talk about Elixir. For clients, for example, when I see, okay, they have a REST API and they don't have microservices and all that. How about Elixir? Ah, it's too young. Mm -hmm. Is it really cool? Maybe yeah, you have some arguments for me, so I'm happy to hear a new success story. Uh, so far, I don't know. Because it's, some, it's not on the list, it's sharp. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Has anyone in the room actually used Elixir for professional work, for professional project? No, no, so far it's only as a hobby. Okay. Yeah. Is anybody out there that, that uses um, Elixir as the question? Yes, of course. WhatsApp is a very prominent um, example in my opinion. I thought it's prominent. I heard that it's Elixir today. I don't know, actually, that's. Maybe you can. Uh, I believe they can easily mix it, right? Exactly. Since it works on the same virtual machine, they can write small yeah. service in various right. languages. I think uh, the, the beauty of um, it's uh, about Alexi is that you can combine best practices from both sides, right? You can use native Erlang code and combine it with Alexi on top. Some people don't like the, the assumption that Alexi is more on like plugin. It's more like, okay, how can I get this into production? Or it doesn't really work. What I've heard from the bus on mm -hmm. internet and Twitter and so on. Really works, but uh, how do we start? Or what would be a nice uh, application? Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the tweet or the, the blog post that really clicked. Start. Was um, this nice post from um, Paul Smith, and uh, I really was happy to read that. And it's explaining. How you can write a JSON API, which is pretty standard in most of the projects. We have microservices everywhere, or services. And yeah, it's actually a use case I, I can move over a lot. What is Phoenix? Have you ever heard of Phoenix before? Mm -hmm. It's a web framework. It's a web framework. There's a, also a PHP framework that is called Phoenix, <laughs> coming from Type 3, if you might have heard that. And there was a. I hope it's not that. I come from PHP, okay, not back from Why is it coming like Phoenix from, from Vash? Okay. It's following me through my life, so I have to pay attention now. I, I believe in that shit. <laughs> Phoenix is um, like Rails or Alexia. That's how I understand it. Correct me if I'm wrong, it's more like a framework for building web applications based on Alexia. Right? Close enough. Yeah, is it is it Rails or is it Sinatra? Is it like it's more like Whip than Rails, so I don't think it enforces as much convention. Yes, right. So, but I mean, you can have a look it's a good way to think about it. Like maybe Sinatra. Yeah, he is elaborating on this. Point. <laughs> Ferrari. <laughs> So this is probably a nice uh, first contact, maybe. Um, I mean, no. It's a test, how you can write tests. And it, it, on this page, actually, it's uh, yeah, very nice. This is a test for Alexia. And uh, here you get some idea of the, of the naming conventions. Or the name, how you can deal with your code. You can write a test, like uh, it reminds me of uh, Maybe it written. So. And what is this here? Pipe operator. From yeah. the what is a pipe? <laughs> functional composition. What is a functional composition? <laughs> Take the result of the expression on the left and put it as the last argument of the expression on the right. Yes. 
nothing. Okay. Oh, Rika does insert as a function, right? It should have one argument. And this argument will be the result of uh, whatever this strange construct in person <laughs> contact returns. What happens here? Anybody follow? I don't know what person contact is. So is it, imagine it's a hash map. Constructing a hash map with a key name and a jump board for is it, is it doing some base structure or something? So yes, this, this is a hash, a contact, which gets inserted into the repository. Then it returns something. This will probably return something. A repo dot insert returns something. It gets piped into the list dot grab, and whatever that returns gets piped into the poison exactly. Like and this then contact as JSON. So um, I would assume, and I'm totally wrong, but something is inserted and returned as JSON. Yeah. Which is probably the same as the inside. Inserted JSON. Um, the idea is that how would that look like in the traditional language? Maybe we can transform. This is live coding. So this pipeline is just basically like pipe in Unix, right? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. It just has this additional character, otherwise it would even look the same. Yes. You okay. know you know from, from Unix, who knows Unix a bit in the pipe? You can actually um, this. What is a good uh, macro? Cat. Cat something okay. pipe would come. Okay. Cat, uh, okay, okay. Just don't list your passwords. <laughs> it's recording. <laughs> it's all encoded. Okay, you can do ls and then pipe, grab, and echo. Um, hello, and it's here. Let's go. I put this into. File. Now I cut this and I get this back, okay? Now I want to, to test if, if there's um, I want to see if there's some content in, in the file. So the idea of Unix is that you have this command. Can you scrap now? Let's so replace space with a new line. You mean? I mean just uh, Alexia uh, item. Okay. I search in Word. You can use Grab in one command, I know that. But it's more for the purpose of, of example. It's uh, okay, thanks. Sensitive. And so now I cat something and I filter it through the pipe to get something back. And this is a very nice um, uh, method of, of processing data. You know, that you have something and you pipe it further and it processes more and more filter it maybe or handle the data as you like. In traditional languages, okay, now just um, imagine that this doesn't exist and they have the Unix co concept in the language, which is super powerful. It's powerful because it makes the code very easy to read, in my opinion. Um, so in the traditional language you would have a different way But this is out of my knowledge at the moment. I know that this exists, but how to use it, 
I mean, this would be too embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> not, not for the audience. No, I, what I want to demonstrate is that this is a headache for me. Especially when the programmer is not nice and then just does this. I can show you the one. Yes, it would be great. Um, so you have this in normal code, and you uh, you have to read from you have to find first the value. What is it about? And then ah okay he's in it, and then he's wrapping it, and he's ah okay now I understand. It. After having to think about the code, the elixir way allows me to to see the data flow more precisely. Okay. You can also always assign the variables. It's like contact equals this hash, then inserted contact equals repo oh, yes. circle. Okay. Yeah, yes, that's yes. another way. <laughs> yes, then you have a <laughs> Yeah, so <laughs> yeah. it's not perfect either, of course. You want to have it? Oh, yeah, are you convinced that the, the first part of no, it? Of course. <laughs> it's more easy to read, that's, that's the whole idea. Um, does someone know if it's also present in Erlang, this operator, or if it's purely Elixir? So Elixir stole it from F sharp. F sharp, okay. Yeah, so F sharp has the exact same operator. Oh, interesting. I don't know where F sharp stole it from. Probably you. It's inspired. Yeah. <laughs> inspired, yeah. Let's go. And the chat to the conference. And Clojure has this thread, last thread first. Mm -hmm. So in Elixir, there's, you can only thread in the first argument, but in Clojure it's like more flexible where you can uh, say, okay, pass the thing on my left hand side to the last argument of the function. Hmm, it's interesting. Closure is both ways. Yeah, it's both ways. Okay. So you see that there's a, also migrations in Phoenix, so the way it's migration. Idea. Concept of who? Uh, yeah, so it has resources just like race. Exactly. Yeah. So it, the idea is to feel comf comfortable at home. Mm -hmm. at least, uh, I think that the history of Alexia is that um, also Flood um, that tried to make Ruby like concurrent and then like. In this uh, new internet area, mm -hmm. area, area, and it doesn't work well because Ruby is processed and they run always in the same issue set. And then I can imagine this moment, I was not there, but I can imagine like, yeah, it has been solved already. I read a book in, at the university or something like this, and there was this crazy thing called Erlang. This is made actually for distributed systems. By Ericsson. Yeah. And they have to hot deploy code in the switches without downtime, and that sounds really amazing. And let's have a look at it and stop the work on Rails and Ruby for a minute and think what we can reuse from all the programmers. I mean, they have a lot of experience, why don't share it and stop reinventing the wheel? I love that. Some people like to reinvent it because it makes their code, I don't know. But I like to, to combine all the knowledge we have with the planet. And I did it in the time of It's great. Um, yeah. by, how can I use Alan? Well, Alexia, sorry. And back framework like Phoenix makes it very easy to, to get started. Um, and uh, for example, a talk, a proof of concept for client, like a small performance test between the Java API and the Phoenix API maybe can highlight some or make some areas more brighter. Because I think, it, or what I want to hear your opinion actually, uh, there's a lot of fear, uncertainty, and doubt, or because it's just not known how Adam works. Um, how can you not sell but convince? People who use more Adam, or do you, do you have an idea um, to say, hey, let's try this in Adam and stop trying to do it in Java, but just open your mind and do something new, that different, because it can sometimes help. I would 
would say that WhatsApp uses Erlang and there are just 20 people mm -hmm. <laughs> serving all these billions of messages, so I would say this can lower your cost. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I, I'm not sure how exactly, how many people do they have, but uh, I know that it's a very small team. 32 engineers. 32 engineers, yeah. yeah. Just for like billions of messages. Yeah, it's billions of messages. It's like technical marketing or what? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Security. Yeah, but it's like ridiculously small team for the work Amazing. that is done there. Amazing. So yeah, so cost is a good argument. <laughs> is it? Because none of the developers will get more jobs on the cloud. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what do you do with all the developers, the Java developers? Oh my god. Okay. <laughs> Good developers will stay in the market. Learn the next year. Yes. <laughs> um, yes. Well, I don't know if you're So, is this the most popular framework in there was Dynamo, I think, or Dynamo framework. Yeah, so Dynamo was the first one, but then they abandoned the thing, and I think most of the team went over to join uh, Tidings. Mm -hmm. And since it's very young language, they are not very, like, there is no big choice of frameworks. I guess the yeah. whole community, because it's more focuses on one product to, to develop it. So I believe we'll see more frameworks in, like, it, it just requires time. time. Maybe that's also one, one reason, speculating, why uh, enterprises are scared of IXC and using something modern like this because it's too unpredictable. Actually, I understand. Like, uh I'm thinking if already Elixir has, uh, if Phoenix has, for example, a library to upload files, library to process images, the stuff that you do in Rails with just a few lines of code, yeah. and, and the gem that is already like three to four years old, and it's tested by hundreds of people. So here you, you, you probably don't have it. So I'm not, I'm not surprised that people are afraid to try it. How do you convince people to try something new like this? I think if you're like comparing a feature parity with Rails, then it, it's a tougher argument to make. But you're saying like, well, like there are certain classes of applications that you cannot build using Rails. Right? Like if you want to build something distributed and fault tolerant, mm -hmm. then Rails is not. In fact, like many other web frameworks, you probably can't do that one thing. Probably Scala and Eka, fine. But that is also like, oh, inspired by a Lang and OTP. So it's the same story. Why not just go for the original? What does OTP mean? It doesn't mean anything now. It used to stand for Open Telecom ah, Protocol. Platform? Yeah. Okay. Then after that, they just like, it's like IBM. What does it stand for now? It just means IBM. Okay. 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 So the, the story was OTP was chosen by the marketing people at Ericsson and they said open because it, it sounded legit and you could sound. Sell more software you put open inside. <laughs> so. Okay. By the way, Erlang also has a web framework. I think it's called Chicago Walls. Yeah. Yeah. Has anyone tried it? Yeah. I'm wondering how is it compared to, to Elixir? Yeah, no, no, I was just asking if anyone has some experience, don't worry. Where is it? Um, there is a nice keynote about Alan and Elixir. Uh, is it from the Elixir Conf keynote? I think so, yeah. So, um, the bottom line, I can send it in the group later. Mm -hmm. The bottom line is that um, Alan has had no marketing intentions. That's why Sun, for example, not, not intended to spread rumors, but that's how I make sense of kind of why Alan has a hard time. Also for me, as I explained earlier, I didn't care about Alan so much because everybody was busy with PHP and um, Java. And that's what I heard as well, that Ericsson just didn't want to yeah. uh, to propagate Erlang. Exactly. They just, it was in the language of their dreams that they want to sell to everyone. And solve the problem. In opposite to Sal, which wanted Java to be everywhere. And yeah, that's where exactly. we are. Exactly. <laughs> now we have the mess. Okay. Thank <laughs> <laughs> you, guys. <laughs> no, just, just kidding. Um, 
this is something yeah, that explains to me like why Alan has a hard time. People complain about the syntax and it's hard to understand, but some people like it actually. So I don't, I don't think it's a, a big problem. It's more like a psychological thing that it's not common and popular to use it for. Uh, I have my Java framework and it works as well. Then does it get interesting to think about Erlang and Alexia then? What I was thinking, again this is totally to, to share with you, um, it's more like internet of things, uh, people or items that communicate with each other and then it totally makes sense that the actor, actor model in the language, which is the core, correct me please, so, yeah. uh, the core the concept of Erlang, to have actors talking to each other through messages. Beautiful. And some actors are available by internet, network connection, or it's just not available. I route to another one and process the message there and get something back. This is how I understand maybe it forward. Um, it's more like communicating processes and it doesn't matter where they are. And it's like, wow, this is exactly how the internet actually was designed. And why are we doing this on a machine? It's Java, like, it does, just makes sense to have a language now. Maybe Internet of Things is one area I see a lot of potential for this. And not the only one, of course. And it's more inspired by, by the other content on the Internet. Um, I think you get the links here. I didn't check that. There are a lot of uh, thoughts about the Internet of Things with Alexia or Erlang then, which I highly recommend you to, to read if you're into this Internet of Things, which everybody probably will be soon at least. So, like big data is just there, just use it. And Alexia looks like a very good tool for that. How difficult is the setup? Did you say who's running Alexia actually or Erlang? Will you just join? Uh, so I've been only playing with it for a bit. Uh, using Mac OS to install, fixing all the exactly. dependencies. If you are familiar with uh, RBMB, it has a DXDMB as well, which allows you to switch version to it. I usually update thing 105 is not today. Huh? Yeah, 105 from the Google. Uh, so you need to update the Google. <laughs> 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 what? Is it old? Yeah. Yes, <laughs> it's old to date, the new version was oh, released. Okay. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> yes, pre install on the Mac and also Ubuntu is probably or Linux, it's very easy. Linux, uh, Windows, I don't know. I think there is installer, like just like standard okay. Windows installer, yeah. Let's have a look. This is Slack channel, thank you for doing Org. Oh, RG. How's your experience so far? How, how do you like Alexia? So one of the biggest things that I can wrap my head around is um, everything seems to be a class call rather than an object. There's no con concept of uh, uh, instance methods anymore. So like constantly you, write, uh, you run just class methods instead of instance yes. methods. Yeah, that was my first impression as well. So for example, if you want to do uh, list processing and whatnot, you're using the enum dot whatever. That's how you do your processing. But I really like the the pipe operators which you use it to kind of chain commands together, very similar to how Unix does that, Unix commands. So it's interesting when you say that there's no instances. So like when I first learned the, the way I met it is the way we talk about instances in object-oriented programming, it's a process in Blazor. So where like Alan K is a person who invented object-oriented programming and there's this funny thing when he invented object oriented programming, he wasn't thinking of Java or C. Yes. Okay. He was thinking of more like cells communicating with each other by sending messages. Yes. Okay. So it's the same way that like Elixir works. Like the actor concurrency model says something like, okay, you have a process, you have a process. And the only way to communicate is to send over a message to each other. So like the moment you spawn a process, it's like in your head you can say, okay, I'm instantiating that object. 
So that's really how, how I plan. Do you, do, you, do you get, do you guys uh, some, I mean, I haven't gotten to that state about inter-process communication and whatnot, and one of the key things that I'm here for is basically trying to understand that and how that actually works, because one of the biggest problems we have, uh, the three of us actually come from the same company, we are building a base solution and we are struggling with Celeroy. Ah, we work with Celeroy? Celeroy. So, base. Yeah. So there's an interesting story about Celeroy's author. So he wrote a programming language called RIA, R E I A. <coughs> so if you look, search for R E I A, A, yeah. From the beginning, I'm okay. not getting us out of the trap we are having to set it up. Because the only reason we use it is because of the MRI uh, that's preventing us having the concurrency right. and whatnot. That's the thing that we are trying to solve. So, yeah, I mean, I, I guess it depends what you guys are building. Like, if you are, you need like lots of processes running, and it needs to be supervised, and it should, like, I think go for it. Because like cellular, like, a lot of its semantics is also based on OTP. Okay. Yes. But the thing is that we don't seem to be using it right. So the investment on trying to take people into cellular versus if we just kind of like try and re-implement it, it's a uh, does it make better sense because would I get something better out of it um, in a shorter period of time to play with it so, and it's an uh, actor based as it would say? That is what we talked about earlier. Yeah. The people like the Wales community thought about making exactly that for Wales because we got this beautiful language and I want to have this concurrency model in the next city and said it doesn't work. No. That form and then okay, let's combine the same error with a beautiful Ruby language. And then you have both the best of both worlds, and uh, it's on your right, and you have a lot of potential. Don't try to pack everything in the Ruby, but use the best of Ruby to scale it. <laughs> Actually, uh, but compared to the Jeff repositories, the Hex repository is like still not that many. It's the same people that worked on Rails. And probably in this area where you are, jump out of this loop and say, okay, let's do it with Anna. It's going to be and joy of movie to Anna. So, I mean, I mean, another way of looking at it is you don't need to give up Ruby entirely because, like, Ruby is like super awesome and like, certain things. But maybe, like, split power app, like, the thing where you need, like, the concurrency stuff. Just leave it to like Elixir for that. But the rest of your web app or whatever app you guys are doing, and just keep yeah, on them. We have that flexibility to do that. We can yeah. apart some of our processes, which is the one that's receiving the messages from uh, a skill worker. Right. That's the one we probably will be the, the, the first candidate. Yeah. yeah. There's a colleague that we want to ask me um, what about the performance of the Elixir of the And I actually I have problems with which a machine cannot be very fast. And I looked it up a bit and that's it's true, it's not the fastest and it's not meant to be the most performing language on earth. It's more like scalability, robustness. Yeah. And what's actually very nice, you can have the, the, the C process inside the actor. Mm. So you have um, you send a message, you process it in C and get a fast response back. So you can have your, your high performance things in the, in the actor. He's processing um, the messages for you and you, you can uh, compute very quickly, as quickly as possible on the machine in C code and get the, the results back. There's a bonus that you have um, fault tolerance and everything for free. That's how I understand it. Cool? Hey! <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's very rewarding to get this feedback because I was like, not sure if it's right. I'm not, not bragging. It's more like thinking out loud now and it, it's cool to get a cool feedback. So you, yes, you can, ha can have high performance with scalability in mind, <coughs> which is for telecommunication very important. It's not always the most performant you need probably, but more stable. stable. So you can combine again both worlds very, very nicely. And can that, combi, uh, can that be combined with a Ruby process here? Right? You can. Know. You can. Like, so I gave a talk once. Basically, we 
uh, it was like a proof of concept. So you got a side kick. Yeah, so side kick, right? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like you could easily like as long as they exchange the same kind of message, you can you can always like rip off side kick and just replace it with your user. Is it like fully interoperable with Erlang? Can you get call all functions in Erlang? Yeah, I can call any Erlang function in Elixir. Yes. In fact, I can do it the other way around. Yes. I can call Elixir from Erlang. I think in general building a language that works on some virtual machine is a great idea because whenever this virtual machine is improved, yep. uh, your language gets faster uh, just by doing nothing. The same is with JRuby, with Clojure that work on JVM. And not only they have access to libraries, but also they don't have to worry about threading because JVM handles yep. it. And the same with speed, whenever JVM is faster, JRuby becomes faster. So what are the other components in so the other only thing which offers like same feature parity would be Eka, the Scala and Eka. But if you look at that documentation, it's very good. On the language. Or like other languages on the other language machine. Yeah. There is a L to E which is used It's created by one of the authors of Alec. Uh, I think like Elixir is by far the most popular one, other than Alec itself. Let's say if someone is going down the road of doing big data where you have Spark and all those, and then Scala is kind of native to Spark and whatnot, then is there something uh, comparable that Elixir where you could actually work out? Not that I know of. Like, I don't think Erlang is a good fit if you want to do like process like big data or like high com like, complex computation stuff. But what, what if the big data is basically live stream data versus storage data because live stream data would be you need to pluck off that message really really fast and then start processing it this kind of stuff and then put the rights and then have other clusters and do the processing there would that be really good? But I guess like there are other like, as you mentioned like there's like Hadoop, Spark and all that kind of stuff which are already built specially for that kind of thing and I think you should just stick with that like for that kind of use case so in that case if I'm going down with the stack which is how do you process that? Yeah, like, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't fit this into like if I want to do a big AI stuff. I don't think it would be a super good use case. So what, what a lot of people do is to have a, a message queue for a high traffic yeah. bad side and. A very popular message queue is right. the queue, which is accidentally oops, it's, it, it's very um, performant and it's written in Erlang. So most of them use uh, Erlang already by using a message queue like Rabbit and queue. So it's very fast. Mm. We'll see. Yeah, for are there any like official online Docker languages? Yes, there are. I need to. The Docker languages. You go and yeah. download Pragmatic, and you will actually see there are some images which you can really spin up. So mm -hmm. if you're on Mac, there's this tool called Pragmatic, mm -hmm. which really allows you to have some uh, views of what's in the registry, and you could actually spin up a. a so I mean, I mean, is there like a Erlang Docker image which is like uh, just Erlang in Docker? What's the name of the tool? Uh, Kitematic. K I T M A T I C. Like, uh, yeah. I know, like. Oops. <laughs> Sorry, the history. <laughs> yes. What's the tool doing? From the express? But no, I, I, I haven't looked at the document, it's just purely online. Like, uh, not sure. Okay. So, I know, like, for closure, like, there is. Closure Docker image in Docker Hub, which is like officially supported by Cognitive or something like that. So, <laughs> okay. I'll just find the one that is maintained. <laughs> yes, that's a problem. And also, the big issue, the big issue that it's like um, Docker is super fast moving, there are a lot of frameworks, tools coming out, which is great. 
And LXC is also fast moving, I'm already outdated. <laughs> <laughs> Which is also great and it takes a lot of it takes a lot of energy to put it in the most, most efficient way to learn it. How did you learn it? For example, now you're writing a book about it. So I've been learning along the way, like writing a book like exposes a lot of things that yes. you just leave out. Like the moment you have to try to explain some to somebody like a particular concept, like holy crap, like there's so much things like so much gaps in your knowledge and then you have to like do lots of research, go on Slack, IRC, yeah. arrest people online. <laughs> <laughs> Is your book open something? No no you have to bug. You have to Yeah. Having some discounts on Manning with his books now. Is it what? Yeah, that's me. Okay. <laughs> I, I, the only thing that's putting me off is the OTP code because it's super trustworthy. I don't dare to go down that route. <laughs> what does it mean, MEEP? M-E-E. It's a many early access program. Okay, I got it. So it's not, okay. So it will disappear. Yeah, yeah. Like, my mom was saying the same thing, like, What's that thing doing there? That looks so ugly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to start another airline. Yeah, I remember the team that this this comfort is yeah. where you know you were the one. Yeah. <laughs> so you have uh, a lot of books already so to make some advertising. Well, it's actually nice. I enjoy your book. Thank you. Okay. Um. This, uh, yeah. Just one more thing, so like uh, Docker, like when you run like these VMs in Docker, like Sublime, like, like, you know, GVM, is there like any, any performance issues or anything running all these VMs? I have no VMs? experience with Docker. So Docker is not a VM. Pardon? Docker is not a VM. It has direct access to no, the I mean, same resources as the bare metal, so yes. it's as close as the bare metal. You are not having any Zen hypervisor, so it's much more performant than the mm -hmm. problem you No, I'm saying if you run, uh, JVM or as Eglan VM using, using Docker. Ah. Is, does it have any. It will be as fast as if you run it on the bare metal. Mm -hmm. If you're interested in numbers, uh, Red Hat made a performance analysis of Docker 2014, so pretty old maybe. Mm -hmm. And they were pretty happy if I were doing correctly. So it, there's no penalty. Because it's talking to the kernel directly and yeah. everything's mm -hmm. native. Yeah. There's a penalty from the Erlang VM. Like the there's nothing to do with Docker. I mean, like exactly. Yeah, there's nothing to do with performance. But sometimes you want more performance than you go to see the file that you can use in the reactor or something. I think yes. I mean, yes. Microservices or whatever, like container. That can really help inject new languages into. Can you switch to Docker in that one? Should developers meet up? Yes. <laughs> Interesting topics meet up. Um, yeah. Docker is very nice one concept. It's very old actually. So, what I tell in Docker introduction is it's very old actually. It's not that cool. They made it accessible and they built the community around because they made the interface and everything around us, which is very nice. But the concept of Docker is also very old. Like LXC, like Linux extendable containers, very old concept. And zones and uh, Solaris and so on is all with the same idea. Maybe people will disagree about it, that, uh, yeah. but the idea is to have uh, courses in a environment that you control and you cannot jump out of it. It's very nice to deploy. Have a look at Docker as well. It's great. So are you more into the, the programming language or more framework or more general discussion which is totally fine. I'm here to just show what I like or how I get started and happy to hear your story. How to get started with Alex? How? Yeah. Go to elixir-lang.org <laughs> and there is a link on the top that says Getting started. Getting started. <laughs> I like yeah, oh, Emacs yeah. is the or what is the best tooling? Sorry? Uh, I think you can use whatever you want. Uh -huh. um, 
currently like lots of people are trying out Emacs maybe because uh, there's this <laughs> plug code alchemist thing is pretty cool. Mm. Uh, it's cool because like it gives like autocomplete and like, you want to show? Uh, uh, I do have my laptop. It's okay. I have some. Yeah, but I can show you the rapport of the record. Yes. Oh, yeah. That's okay. good. It's um, Here goes nothing. One, one, one thing is um, Excel. Uh, ah, yeah. Uh, there's another one which I highly recommend uh, Elixir, uh, Elixir Experiences. So mm -hmm. it's a series of uh, challenges that you could actually go through. It gives you some. Uh, I think you have to join the two words together to get the Linux experience. The Linux experience without an S. Yeah, join it together as a, as a word. Yeah, try that. So, <laughs> experience functions. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, 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 there's just it's, it's one at the bottom. It's uh, the it's scroll, yeah, down. scroll down. Ah, yeah, yeah. There's there's one. One. This one is very cool. So, if you're interested in functional programming, you guys see through that. Or to more um, that's the equivalent of IDs on Erlang game, like, like on JV. Then. <laughs> I think IntelliJ has a decent Erlang plugin. Uh -huh. um, there, there is work on the Elixir plugin also. So I think it's pretty, it's pretty okay now for what? The fact that it is basically a scripting language, I mean, then and whatnot gives you quite a lot of choose uh, to Yeah. I mean, most of the time, all you want is syntax type. It's helpful. What I really want is experiment my code quickly, so the IEF is mm. really, really cool. So then, uh, aside, then you finish yeah, yeah, go for it. It really helped you to get thinking about mm -hmm. let's see, like, um, Get real, like the first time you are uh, stuck in a new language, happened uh, this exercise, which is a bit embarrassing again, but it's just a filter text and response. Something to make a test uh, succeed. So the exercises are simple, but uh, in a new language, how, how do I do it? And this is the first time I really got stuck and have to search and ask people, and this is actually a great thing. These exercises are great in my opinion. And there's also a nice how to get started, how to install. And you can, if you're interested, you can, for example, um, Right. 
this uh, elixir coins. Uh, then we have that. But I this option we get that. It's also the idea of the same Yeah. And then we get stuck. What is the actual version, which is so cheap? Uh, actually, there's a word that's done. I think it's fast to apply. I would say to this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, the problem is I don't understand mm -hmm. the problem of the mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. whether this is something I have to fix. Mm -hmm. Because when I go mm -hmm. to yeah, the, the, the one before this, right? Mm -hmm. I don't know if mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I'm home to the one where Any questions so far? There's no questions. This looks like it's not. Can you like, you like open C so far? Which one? Um, half the night. Amazing. You want to see the purple? Okay, the stage, yes. Thank you. I will be in the project or you want to go? No, I can just like open IDX. Okay. So, okay. just IDX. No, um, this is not my book. So I bought it because it was the okay. No, it's not mine. Sorry? So it's, uh, oh, there's a fridge over there. Just going back. So. I don't know exactly what I'm going to show, but like, I'll, I'll show the type operator first. Because I think. So IEX is the. Uh, yeah, so IEX is like IRB or Python or no. So it's the the read if you are window. But is it like um enclosure, right? So it's like whether it's a program enclosure or if you feed it to the reference, it's MVC. Sorry, I missed that. Okay. Enclosure, if you uh, write it as a file, yeah. or you feed it one by one through the reference. Both are same exactly I mean yeah. production or whatever yeah, 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 yeah. is it exactly like in itself? Yeah, so I can like have a running program, uh -huh. and then I can just open an IEX session inside. Yeah, but the real running program, uh -huh. it's uh, it's it's compiled. So you you write your source as a dot exs script, or it could be compiled to a dot ex. So you still write the file, mm -hmm. but the IEX allows you like IRB, or if you are using Python four, allows you to quickly cast out certain commands, certain uh, functions. Then you want to know whether it works or not mm. without having to go through the whole compilation process. That's the benefit of uh, repo. So and it's really this, like this thing asking whether like enclosure or repo is uh, why do you ask? Why should it be different? I mean, yeah. where is it any different? I mean, closure is exactly the same. Yes. Right? Exactly the same. Name. Why should it be different? Yeah, that's what I'm asking. Because other languages, it's not like that, right? Like, which one? Ruby is like that, Python is like that. Yeah, okay, but compiled languages rarely. Yeah. Oh, Linux is also rarely compiled languages. In Scala, you have it as well. Scala has a record. So. Okay. C, C, uh, Java itself yeah. doesn't have yeah. But if you consider Scala as Java, then yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so yeah, so how is it working in Scala? Because Scala is a compiled language as well, so is it like just in time compiler working or I don't know how they I believe like this is the case that. in Elixir. That there is just in time compiler or I don't think I don't think the beam is a JIT. It probably has to just compile everything again. I think it's some ahead of time capabilities, mm -hmm. but I don't think it's a JIT. Okay. I don't think it's just in time. Okay. So everyone know IEX before CD. Okay, awesome. So no. Okay. So, this is a list. And like, it's like a glorified company that can do like stuff inside. Oh. Alright, um, it's a pretty nice help system. So, I can do like, okay, so H is essentially help. I can do like, let's say I, I want to know what Inam does. So, it gives me everything formatted in Markdown. Um, if I want something like map, I can get that kind of information too. Uh, so, hypocrisy. Let's say I have a list of 1, 2, 3. 
เก็บไปปิดที่ทน้ำก่อนแม่So it's not assignment operator, right? It's not assignment yeah, operator. Exactly. So this is already on my mind growing experience for most of Yeah, if you yeah, if you come from different languages yes. where equal is usually the assignment, yeah, then this is totally different. So H. I started from Pascal, for me it was comparison operator <laughs> in the beginning. Yeah. So it's strange because like in older programming languages to make sure that it wasn't equality, they would do like something. Yeah, like yeah, yeah exactly, yes. Right, but after that people got lazy and like people treat it as like equal. And the, I think the older programmers got itchy. Like, uh, I think it was because uh, some people decided that you assign often than you compare, so the assignment operator should be simpler. Mm. That's it. I think this is the genius that I made wrong. Yeah. So this this very cool thing. So. Um, when Erlang was invented, the first version of the Erlang compiler was written in Prolog. And Prolog has this very nice... So all these pattern matching goodness all basically come from Prolog. And one of the nice things about Prolog is this pipe thingy. So what this does is it... Have you ever seen this before? Yeah, on Prolog classes. Prolog. <laughs> <laughs> at, at university. <laughs> So what this does is it it chops off the first element of the list. So H traditionally is A and T is tail. So when you do this, it just returns you the entire expression to at least one, two, three. But H is one and T is tail. And this this is nice because a list is basically the head and the tail is the rest of the list. So a list is like a recursive structure. And if you dig into like um, Elixir programs and Erlang programs and Prolog programs, a lot of times like it's all recursion. Everything is recursion. So let's see if I can if I can do okay. You have Vim installed? Vim. Vim, yeah. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> So for example, I want to implement a say count, right? So count, I'll take in like this. So the way I'll think, I'll, the way I think about it is if I have, oops, if I have an empty list, it should be like zero, right? But if now I have a, if I have a non-empty list, I can destructure it and say that okay, the first part is a head and the last part is a tail. 